This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The Christian heroes who defended the West against Islam. That's this week on A View from the Bunker. Imagine a wave of terror attacks across our country. Unexpected, shocking, deadly, and provoked by a single email. The government responds with lockdowns and lockups of anyone with unapproved ideas, and uh, they add in mandatory vaccines. That's the premise behind my novel, The God Conspiracy. And your response to our special offer in the month of August was so overwhelming, and, and we are grateful for that, that we've decided to extend it. The God Conspiracy plus the theology behind the novel, 12 hours of our video teachings taken from presentations we've recorded over the last five years. 12 hours of video in all on four DVDs, all together, a $120 value. We're offering it to you during the month of September for just $35 plus shipping and handling. It's a compelling story that I hope you appreciate. But more than that, the video teachings on the long supernatural war in which we all play a part from Eden to Armageddon. Take advantage of it now. Available online at the Gilbert House store only, gilberthouse.org. And we thank you for your prayers and your support. It's not a story that we often hear in the corporate media here in the West because it doesn't fit the narrative. See, Islam is a religion of peace, you see. Except that it's not. Our guest has been on this program several times before. We're happy to have him back because he's got a brand new book here. He's got a unique perspective on this this uh, history between Islam and the West. In fact, one of his books devoted to that uh, cause. He's uh, born and raised in the United States to uh, parents of Egyptian ancestry who were born and raised in the Middle East. So he's got a unique perspective there. He is a Christian, currently serves as the uh, Shulman Fellow, a Shulman Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center, Distinguished Senior Fellow at the Gatestone Institute, Judith Friedman Rosen Fellow at the Middle East Forum, and he's the author of a couple of books that we uh, highly recommend, Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War against uh, on Christians, Sword and Scimitar. 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West, and the new book, the subject of our discussion today, Defenders of the West, The Christian Heroes Who Stood Against Islam. We're honored to welcome back to the program, Raymond Ibrahim. Raymond, it's uh, good to have you back on the program, and uh, we, we mentioned before we started recording here, I, I hadn't planned on this, but uh, this is uh, going out and being released on the uh, 11th of September, which... Uh, most of us Americans would, would associate with a specific event in 2001, but actually you wrote quite a bit about uh, an event uh, in the, the September 11th. I remember it's uh, 1683. Was that right, the year? Yeah, the, the Battle of Vienna, the Great Siege. The Ottoman Turks had uh, uh, surrounded and were choking Vienna uh, in Austria, the, you know, and which was really the capital of the Holy Roman Emperor uh, Empire. So it was pretty significant at the time. And, um, you know, the siege had been going on for months and it's it's. Yeah, pretty horrific stuff. It's what you expect from sieges, you know, dysentery and pestilence and death all around. Um, and then on that date, you know, September 11th, or or as some sources put it, September 12th. It depends, you know, th does the charge begin, begin at night? Does it enter the next day? But that's when uh, Jan Sobieski or John Sobieski, the Polish king, um, you know, with a coalition of other, uh, you know, Germans and so forth, came down from the hill and, you know, waged battle. And as usual, when it came to Christians versus Muslims, the Christians were outnumbered vastly, but they actually, um, you know, uh, you know, they were victorious. They beat the Muslims and the, the, routed the, uh, the Ottomans and the siege came to an end. It's actually a very important day and again you know it's unfortunate we don't remember these things they're just dates they mean nothing but uh you know the whole of christendom could have been you know snuffed out right then and there because if you took vienna that's it all of europe is you know open to you and that was actually the goal for the ottomans for centuries yeah it must have been an amazing sight i mean um, as a fan of the lord of the rings movies the charge of the uh um Oh my goodness! The the, uh, the, the Rohirrim, fields. yes, yes, the Rohirrim, uh, charging down there it was just an amazing sight. But you can imagine something like that happening for real with the Sobieski and his winged hussars flying down the hill at these stunned Ottomans who were like, "Where did these guys come from?" Just as they were breaking through the walls of Vienna. Yeah, it's it's actually interesting because Token, you know, who himself, of course, is a Christian. Uh, it, it's very clear that he borrowed a lot of things from the this long war between Christendom and Islam. Um, you know, the, the Battle of the Hornburg, um, which again is the Rohirrim, 
that is, I believe, largely based on, uh, you know, this battle Kovadanga from the 8th century when the Muslims were attacking a small remnant of Christian Spaniards up in the Northwest Caves. Literally, Kovadanga means the cave of the lady. Hmm. And uh, they were outnumbered and, you know, it was a very heroic final kind of, uh, you know, they burst out just like in the movie and actually routed the Muslims. So, yeah, men like Token were definitely aware of that long history. The Siege of Gondor is very much similar to the Siege of uh, Constantinople. You know, I mean, even in the details, it's, I think it would be great if someone, unless they haven't, unless they have already created a documentary or a book showing all these parallels between, you know, how Token was really thinking in these, um, you know, civilizational conflicts, which he himself experienced. That's, uh, I think you may have just uh, invented a new project for yourself. Um, your new book, uh, Defenders of the West, you, uh, Sobieski's not in the book, but you cover him quite extensively in Sword and Scimitar, but, uh, you, you see, select eight other Defenders of the West. And it, as you pointed out in our previous interviews, the, the whole, the term the West, uh, was invented because that's what was left of Christendom after the armies of Islam got done taking the Levant, taking the Holy Land, taking most of the Mediterranean, um, why did you choose specifically these eight men? Yeah, that's a great question, which I discussed at some length in the introduction, because I think it's a valid question. Um, so to start with, all eight men were, to me, pretty uh, innately interesting uh, from my earlier readings and studies and so forth. Um, and there's certainly no dearth of what I, what I classify as Christian heroes who fought and resisted and stood against Islam. But, uh, you know, some of the considerations that, you know, came into play were, uh, for example, I would have wanted to write something about Charlemagne, okay, or Charles Martel. And, mm -hmm. and, and both of them are actually in my previous book, Sword and Scimitar. But there's just not enough source material to do them justice in a full chapter. In this book, I allot anywhere between 30 and 40 pages most of which is derived from primary sources. So that was definitely a consideration to try to, and that's why when you look at the book, the characters who come in in the 15th century, I think you're gonna find those chapters are a little more colorful because we just have so, many, so much more sources uh, as opposed to the very earliest chapters. Which I even discuss this is not to take away from you know the valor of the of the of the fellows in the first chapters uh, because I think they were even more determined in their uh, obstinacy vis-a-vis -vis Islamic jihad um, if you read between the lines. But so yeah, so there were a lot of different factors of why. But in the end, to be honest with you, I picked these men because out of the vast array of characters that I drew with my wide net originally before I started writing, they were originally my favorites for various reasons. And um, I thought it was also good because they really cover the uh, the the entire theater of war between Islam and uh, Christendom. You got two chapters from Spain with the Reconquista and all all that's going on there. You got three chapters in the Balkans, of course, with the Ottoman, uh, which we as we discussed with the Siege of Vienna, and you got uh, three chapters of the Holy Land, of course, which is the only form of uh, military conflict between Christendom and Islam from a historical perspective that most Westerners know about. The Crusades. But, uh, you know, again, I, as with the other book in this book, I just try to emphasize the Crusades were really <laughs> almost like a drop in the bucket of really the long war between Islam and Christendom. And they're just emphasized simply because they make Christians look like the aggressor. Mm -hmm. But if you really look at in the in the long continuum, they're just a small slither to two centuries of literally almost 14 centuries of mostly Muslims going on the offensive. One of the other uh, issues that you address in the introduction, and I want to bring that out here, is uh, your use of primary sources. You quote extensively and uh, sometimes very uh, lengthy uh, s s bits of, uh, of description from contemporaries or near contemporaries of the men that you write about. Why did you lean so heavily on, um, on primary sources? I'm a big fan of primary sources. You know, that's, as, as I say, you know, that's uh, straight from the horse's mouth. Um, and I'm tired of reading secondary sources by well-known historians who don't even bother to give you a footnote. You know, and it's like you're just supposed to believe them because they're, they have all these letters behind their names or they're popular or whatever. And, and I've also often found, having consulted the primary sources, that oftentimes these secondary sources written by these acclaimed academics and scholars and whoever – actually don't have any foundation as opposed to what they claim. I mean, I've actually, and, but how many people will do that? You know, will actually read Karen Armstrong or John Esposito and then go and try to find the, yeah, but you know, you're in the minority. And so on, right? and that's, that's, that's their strategy. 
But when you go in and you look, it's kind of, and I'm, and I've given you extreme examples, Karen Armstrong, she's a renowned apologist, but even those who, who just seem neutral, and you go and you look, and it's sometimes just not there, what they're talking about, or it's really distorted for an obvious agenda, conscious or unconscious, I don't know. So that's why I always lean heavy, as I say in the introduction, you know, I don't, I don't expect, unlike those people, I don't expect anyone to take my word on it. And that's why in this book, in Defenders of the West, you're going to see, I think, 1,200 uh, endnotes, citations. Um, not all to primary sources, but they're at least to something, you know, secondary, some of them. Because, um, I, you know, I, I want the reader to know, I'm not making this up, you know. And, and which leads to a really interesting point that even though I'm not making any of this up and I found it written somewhere, the narrative itself is just so exciting that any of these chapters, I think, could become a movie by themselves. Yes. Without having to fake it. You know, I mean, we're used to Hollywood. Hollywood has to create, you know, fictitious tales to interest us. I think these, as objective as they are and based on primary sources, are even more sensational. And it's the whole idea of truth is stranger than fiction. Right? This could be, yeah, this could be a fascinating docuseries, an eight-part docuseries, one week spent on each of these uh, these yeah. eight men. This would be a really fascinating thing. So let's, let's dive into some of these. We won't have time to cover uh, many of these. And to be honest with you, I'm only two and a half chapters in, but uh, I'm familiar with a couple of the other guys here in, uh, that, that you cover. But but uh, the, I, I, d- digging deep into a couple of these that uh, maybe we've heard of, but not really, uh, but we've been getting the secondary source modern scholarship version of, uh, for example, Godfrey of Bouillon, who was uh, among the first crusade uh, and a leader in the first crusade. And of course, we've been taught that the crusades were bad Christian um, uh, aggression against the Muslims who've... <laughs> <laughs> who've always lived in the Holy Land. They've, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, wait, wait. That was Christian territory until the 7th century. Uh, Duke Godfrey. Who was Godfrey and what made him so exceptional? Yeah, Godfrey to me is one of the most uh, um, impressive. And, and, you know, he's chapter one. And so he does come from that era that I was mentioning where we we have some somewhat of a dearth of actual sources um, we have a lot, of course, on the First Crusade, which she's in, but we don't have the, you know, the close panoramic kind of view of who Godfrey was. So I really had to do a lot of um, researching and piece together his life from various sources. You know, we have a lot of sources in the Crusades, but you will find just a small bit of him here, there and so forth. But I think I was able to, you know, I managed to put a narrative together. But Godfrey basically is known as one of the first leaders of the First Crusade. Um, one of the main leaders, there's about five or so. You have Bohemond and, uh, you know, Tancred, his nephew, the Normans. You got Raymond of uh, Toulouse uh, uh, from France. or uh, Basically, they're all Franks in the mind, in the Muslim mind. And you have many others. But he was what I find. And so to me, the real question was, I'm going to do a first crusader. Who do I pick? There were a lot that were very interesting. But I picked him in the end because I just was really impressed with, you know, he, he, he really fused piety, okay, with militancy. Uh, so, for example, Bohemond, another famous, arguably more famous than Godfrey, uh, wanted to fight the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Emperor. Right, Because right. of you know, you know, the, the Catholic, Orthodox, all that. Um, and he told Godfrey, join me. before we Right when they were going on the Crusades, of course, they all stopped in Constantinople. And uh, Bohemond said, let's attack him to help further the crusade. Godfrey said, I have the quote in the book, but he said something to paraphrase, I will not turn arms pledged to the infidel against Christians or something to that effect. And that's really the whole tenor of who Godfrey was all throughout. You know, he's always at the forefront of the attacks fighting. He's always the one who's being modest and not, you know, taking advantage of certain situations. Um, you know, there's an int- I don't want to give too much away. And I don't want to be a, a spoiler because there's a lot of interesting adventures. But one of them features a bear attack. Uh, he was actually trying to help a fellow Christian in the mountains when they were all starving, as is famous, famously known in the First Crusade, before they reached Antioch. And that debilitated him for months. And he was near dead, came back, continued the good fight. Essentially, he was the first to, after Antioch was conquered, which was a major, uh, you know, watershed moment for the First Crusade, he was the first to head out again for the original purpose, which is liberating Jerusalem, the Holy Land. And, you know, long story short, after, you know, the first crusaders took Jerusalem, you know, the the great feats of arms that he committed there. And then, you know, they had a council. We need a king. Right. And uh, he was he was one of those who was elected by the, the, the rank and file. 
And one of the election processes, uh, you know, to, was the electors uh, actually questioned the followers of the various men that were put up uh, to be to be king. And when they came to Godfrey's men, their main complaint, and this is after having taken an oath and swearing, is that he just spent too much time talking to monks when they would uh, visit an abbey or a church, <laughs> that their meal got cold. <laughs> and so they were really annoyed. And then it really culminates with, you know, so the crown is given to him, but he refuses being called king. And he says, I refuse to wear a crown of gold where my Lord were, wore a crown of thorns. Wow. So you really, yeah, that line of piety, um, you know, medieval style really runs through his life from beginning to end. He, it's, it's interesting about him, too, because he's what a lot of scholars point to as the bad guy. They, they talk about second sons when they talk about the Crusades, which means you, you didn't have land because of you know primogeniture and your father. Uh, you're the oldest son gets everything. So he was a second son, but he actually did have quite a lot of possessions and he gave a lot of them away and he sold others to raise money for the crusade. And, you know, again, I, I hate, I don't want to ruin it, but he, he didn't live too long to enjoy being, yeah. uh, he, like I said, he didn't take the term King. He called himself the guardian um, of the sep of the Holy Sepulcher or the defender, which is very apt for my book, defenders of the West. Yeah. Godfrey's life really uh, illustrates something that uh, that you mentioned early in the book, that uh, in the Middle Ages, Christendom, Christianity, was considered a rather muscular faith. It was not, um, you know, this uh, baby Jesus, meek and mild kind of faith that was uh, considered uh, important. It, it, there was a priority that was placed on liberating Jerusalem. And uh, it, it was like Jerusalem had was part of our territory as we, the inheritors of the faith, we let it fall into the hands of infidels. We have to go get it back, uh, just as you wouldn't allow the enemy to come and take the capital city of your your nation or your dukedom. Or it, it, it was there was a different view of Christianity back then. I mean, the I guess the idea of um, Augustine's just war was uh, really pondered a lot more, a, a lot more than uh, than we modern day Christians. And oddly enough, we in the modern in modern America, uh, conservative American Christians tend to be very supportive of our nation and our military. And yet our military ventures today are fought for very different reasons. You, you comment on that just a little bit in the introduction to the book. How would somebody like Godfrey have looked on modern day politicians and what we prioritize as war worthy? Yeah, yeah, that's a great you know observation, something that and I do discuss it a, a, a bit in the introduction, but definitely we can wax on that philosophically. Uh, but basically, the Christians of the pre-modern era, as I call them, you know, just war theory was a serious thing. OK, you know, it's you can love the enemy, but you don't you've got to hate the sin. All right. And you fight it and you combat it. You're not a doormat. I think the problem is so much of Christianity today has been turned into what I call a doormat form of Christianity. And this really runs through all the denominations. It's not any particular denomination. It's just it's the geist. It's the spirit. It's the worldview of this era, um, which is that to be a Christian, you ju your job is to turn the other cheek. And it's to be essentially a doormat and you never judge. Who are you to judge? Um, and that just was never the case for centuries, okay? including with Protestants in the very, you know, in the very early centuries. Um, this is a modern phenomenon, I think. And, you know, I associate it. I find it interesting, you know, when you when you watch the media and you listen to especially secular worldly types, oftentimes the most, um, you know, avowed enemies of Christianity are the ones who go out of their way to pontificate to Christians about the need to love their enemy. Okay, it's very self-serving, and sadly, too many Christians fall for it. And I think, I think a, a great many amount of Christians also, you know, make um, make a virtue of their cowardice. You know, they they pretend mm. to be mm. tolerant and forgiving, but they're just you know anti-confrontational and they don't want to rock the boat. That's who they really are. So, yeah, there's a vast difference between the men that I cover, the, as I call them, the defenders of the West, who without them. And it's funny, today's, you know, our day and age, including Christians, will, you know, mock these men and, and, and you know, and, and get angry at me for even calling them Christians. These were the men who embodied what's today dismissed and condemned as toxic masculinity, patriarchy, racism. I mean, these yeah. guys were just, you know, just brewing with what what would be called that, of course, that's not what they were. Yeah, they were definitely masculine. 
and that's what's called toxic masculinity. Just regular masculinity is, is toxic today. Um, and they had their priorities straight. So as you say, for them going and, and recovering their holy territories, okay, and also, and, and it's always emphasized that they went on the crusade to just liberate the sepulcher and so forth, but actually the, the twin aim was to help Christians, to help Eastern, their Eastern co-religionists who were literally in, in the years and decades before the first crusade were being massacred by the tens of thousands and churches were being burned by the thousands, all in Asia Minor and in the Holy Land. So, you know, the, to them, they're not going to be doormats, okay? They're, they're, you have to stand for what's right, okay? That's the, the idea was they stood for what's right. So it was a better, it was a happy balance between you. And this is the whole idea of just war theory, hmm. which was very prominent in the medieval era, which is, sure, I as an individual can turn the other cheek. I can forgive, and I should as a Christian. But law and order has to reign in society. And uh, so that's sort of what they believed. And that's what they, you know, what led them to do what they did, which is fight against a hostile Islamic force on these various theaters of war that I discuss. Yeah, it's a real contrast between uh, what you describe in your book here and uh, modern day Western democracies that are willing to go to Afghanistan and fight for the right of girls to go to school. But uh, not a word is said about the... uh, the Christians of northern Iraq, who's, uh, well, the Christians of Iraq in general, after we went in in 2003, uh, what, it was went from like 2 million Christians down to about 125,000? Huh? And it only it only became an issue in around 2015, as I recall, uh, just as it became clear that the American public was really getting sick of being in that, oh, well, hey, we have to go defend the Christians. Really, what's been going on there? Because on our watch... With our troops in country, the Christians in Iraq were decimated. We weren't doing a very good job of defending them. And again, you just have to wonder what men like Duke Godfrey would have to say about uh, about our politicians. Well, that, that, and that's just it. You know, we here in the modern West, you can condemn, oh, what primitive superstition nonsense they went to fight for a so-called holy land. Well, look at what we fight for, you know? Yeah. I mean, what? Just uh, what are we fighting for? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> especially if you're a Christian, you know, you got to look at what your government's doing, and it's not fighting for anything that's holy. No, that's all. that's a uh, fact. It's like the opposite often. You, you mentioned a couple of men in, uh, in Spain, and uh, again, this is something that most Christians aren't familiar with. I've done some presentations on my book, Bad Moon Rising, and, and show on a map where Charles Martel put a stop to uh, things in 732, at the Battle of Toulouse, was it? The Tours, Tours. Uh, yeah, and tours. yeah, and if, if he'd, uh, you know, if the uh, the Muslim advance had continued, they, they may well have crossed the English Channel, and uh, things would have been very, very different for us here in the United States, being the descendant of, you know, some Englishmen who decided to uh, flee the country back in the 17th century. The, the, there's a gentleman you you write chapter two of your book devoted to a guy who I've seen. I, I seem to remember like a, a movie or television series where El Cid, um, but he was nothing like what I thought. Right. You know, again, the impression I had is very different from what's in your book. What, what, what was his real name and why was the why did the enemy, why did the Muslims call him El Cid or the Cid? Right. So we're talking about uh, in the colloquial Spanish, Rodrigo um, uh, Diaz de Vivar from Vivar um, in Spain. Uh, or Roderick, really, to you know, to give him his earlier, more you know, Anglican name, because I mean, it's this is the time of the Visigoths becoming Spaniard, so it gets all mixed up. At any rate, you're obviously you're alluding to you know Charlton Heston movie, the famous, right, right. Uh, I think 1960, whatever El Cid, and you know, and again, you see it. I mean, back then in the early in the 60s, okay, you have these woke elements uh, because of course it's Hollywood, and so what they really emphasize in that movie is how El Cid. Uh, Roderick Rodrigo is very sort of tolerant. He's not a jingoist. He's not. He's not very you know <laughs> proactive about his Christianity. He's very welcoming and tolerant of Muslims, and uh, and the bad guys are the other Christians who are you know all about crusading and reconquista and all that. Okay, like Alfonso VI, the sixth, uh, the the Spanish king of the time. Um, but if you, when you read, and again, you know, it's it's like there's a kernel of truth in that, but it's really pulled out of context. So yeah, of course there was. Spain really was a very interesting microcosm of the Islamic Christian sort of jihad reconquista thing uh, for centuries, and there was this thing going on up in. So you know, Islam was in the mid to southern half, and the Christians were in the mid to northern half of Spain, 
Um, and the more north you went in, in, in the Spanish controlled areas known as El Andalus, um, <laughs> which comes from uh, the Vandals, actually, and that's a whole interesting etymology. But anyway, <laughs> if, if you go up uh, halfway through, th they were actually very much mixed with the Christians, including racially. Um, you know, a lot of these caliphs, uh, someone did a study, and the final Umayyad caliph in the 11th century was apparently less than 1% Arab. Because what the caliphs did, of course, is they would marry Spaniard, Euro European harem women, and they would have a son, and then you know the son would be split in half. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was so surprised by that that I actually highlighted that. It was like a point zero zero nine percent, I think, is the, right. uh, the the figure. I mean, that's like what? <laughs> right, but it really sheds light on on to why um, there was some sort of cooperation between the northern. Moors, as they were called, or Muslims, and the Christians, they were actually very similar um, racially. And, and it's also well known that during this era, the Muslims, especially in that region, were very um, nominal. Okay, they, they were what you would call a moderate Muslim today. <laughs> so you, you had some sorts of alliances going on between these various Christian kingdoms and the Muslims. But when it really got ugly, and then the Moors called for a, a pristine Islamic group from North Africa, the Al Moravids, as they're called, which comes from an Arabic word that means that, you know the men who man, basically the jihadists. That's what they were. They were very, they were what you would call today a radical ISIS type group. They actually dressed in pure black, and their eyes. Actually, the movie the El Cid gets that right because that's how they appear, always dressed in black, and so forth, and you know screaming Allah Akbar, that sort of thing. Once those entered into Spain and all the Muslims joined forces with them, then the Cid completely changed and there was no more toleration. And you know, he was very, uh, very openly pro-Christian and, uh, you know, and just way and he and but what makes him really important and, 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 you know, one of the earliest medieval poems from Europe is all about his life and it, which is very interesting because in that era, you only wrote you had epics only about kings and he wasn't. He was actually a lesser noble. So it just shows you uh, how influential he was. And when you read it, if you read the chapter, you know, chapter two, the battles he, that he was in just single handedly with a few group, a small handful of men. And he would just fight the most ferocious jihadist group that I mentioned from North Africa. And he would time and time again <laughs> defeat them and, and, you know, and disgrace them. And again, always, you know, there's an undertone of Christianity versus Islam. This isn't just some war about territory. There's the ideological religious component. And it's with El Cid too, so that's why you know very interesting character definitely belonged in in this book on um, defenders of the West. But he's one of those guys because he is so popular historically that Hollywood had to turn its attention to, and then they watered him down mm -hmm. to something palatable to our sensibilities. And his uh, time frame, uh, and uh, just to give people a sense of where this is happening in history, that he was the latter part of the 11th century. Yeah, he's actually contemporary with the First Crusade with Godfrey. Okay. He lived at the same time. He's probably 15 years older than Godfrey. Um, and actually, it's known that during, I think, July 15th, 1099, is when uh, the Crusaders uh, reconquered Jerusalem in the name of Christ Christianity. And, and the only shadow of gloom during that week is that's when the Cid died, same week. Hmm. Uh, El Elf, the Cid was, was so popular during his lifetime that uh, that caused some problems with King Alfonso. Uh, what was going on there with Alfonso and his court that uh, he just couldn't stand having the Cid around? Yeah, and, they, and, and the movie, the 60s movie, actually sort of reflects that. Um, Alfonso VI was actually, he's credited formally with being the man who starts the Reconquista. In 1085, he conquered or reconquered Toledo, which is right in the center of uh, Spain and which had been under Islamic control since the Islamic invasion in 711 uh, in the eighth, early eighth century. And it was actually the capital of the Visigoths. So in, con in reconquering it, it had, you know, it had a, an impact on everyone, Muslim and Christian. Uh, it was very symbolic and so forth. So he, he himself is known as, you know, a, a, one of the major players, but the Cid, you know, his, his lowly vassal always, <laughs> you know, out, outshone him fighting against the Muslims. And uh, on, on at least two occasions, Alfonso exiled him. And there's always a pretext, okay? But it, it, according to, if you read between the lines, he just was jealous. And the Cid was a sort of, you know, headstrong man that earlier he served uh, um, uh, Alfonso's older brother, Sancho. But then Sancho was killed, and, and this is also in the movie. Um, and there's, you know, there was some rumors that Alfonso was responsible. He assassinated, he helped assassinate his brother so he could become mm -hmm. king. Um, and, and Sid, before pledging his loyalty 
to Alfonso, forced him publicly to put his hand on a Bible and swear three times that he had nothing to do with the killing of his brother and that if he was lying, he would go to eternal hell. Hmm. So, you know, he was definitely a formidable character. Hmm. So after the Cid died, uh, what happened in Spain? How did the situation change? So, yeah, as you point out, you know, this is the 11th century, um, late 11th century. And after he dies, actually, the Muslim, uh, you know, jihad makes a comeback. And all the gains that he had made quickly crumble because, you know, that again shows you his own singular ability to be a great, you know, essentially a warlord. Um, but, you know, at that point now, there was no end to men who would wage the Reconquista. And you get king after king and noble after noble. This is all they do because with the Almoravids, it became, you know, there, there was some semblance of cooperation after the 8th century Islamic conquest, because like I said, there was a sort of assimilation going on. But when these new Muslims came from Africa, and the first wave is the Almoravids, but then a second wave comes, which is even more radical, the Almohads, which comes from the term al muwahideen When you see ISIS do the finger, mm -hmm. the oneness of Allah, that's what they are named, Mohad, one, okay? Um, so very, very radical group. And um, but and, and you know here here again we see in compare and contrast with the modern era you know what did the Christians of northern Spain do they didn't sue for peace they didn't appease or anything they actually just fought back fire with fire and uh, very violent conflicts in those early 12th and 13th centuries and it's interesting because in many ways it culminates in chapter four of the book with a descendant of the Cid which is Ferdinand Ferdinand the third of Castile known as Saint Ferdinand or mm -hmm. Saint or Saint or in California San Fernando in Texas. <laughs> that's who, who that's what they're named after, right? Um, and another, you know, another man who was so you know committed to the Reconquista, to reclaiming Spain for for it for Christianity, to ejecting, you know, Islamic intolerance and, and all because the stuff that we talk about today, killing bla you know, blasphemers, attacking Salman Rushdie, that sort of thing was embedded in the history of wherever Islam was, except it was even more graphic, mm. and it was it was it was on display in Spain as well. Um, I mean, and I get a lot. There's so much to talk about there, but really, you know, so it, uh, a lot can be said about San, Saint Ferdinand, but I'll leave it there. But he definitely helped uh, spearhead the the Reconquista and uh, more or less brought it to a close. If Ferdinand was uh, was uh, also related uh, through marriage to uh, another gentleman in the book here, King Richard the Lionheart. Now, all I know really about Ro Richard the Lionheart is either from the uh, the Disney cartoon, where uh, King John is you know an evil sni sniveling uh, lion or what or whatever. And Robin Hood and, and yeah. Robin Hood, right, right. Uh, but also in the Lion in Winter, where he's played by. Uh, what Anthony Hopkins? Peter O'Toole. Oh no, no, yeah. And Peter O'Toole plays yeah Henry. Henry. Uh, wonderful movie, but uh, again, you yeah. don't get much of the sense of what Richard is really about, and they they portray him in a way that's uh, perhaps not consistent with his uh, his martial abilities. Well, let's look at one point in that movie, and like you, I really like that movie. I don't like the rendering of Richard. Um, they actually portray him as a homosexual. Yeah, and you know, this is in the this is in the sixties. And, and that actually goes back to a scholarly interpretation that began literally maybe in 1960. That's the first inkling that you get any word about Richard being a homosexual. And what's it based on? Well, it's based on the fact that even though he was married, he never had any children, even though he did have one illegitimate son. Mm -hmm. okay? So I, I suppose that means every barren man is now a homosexual, uh, according to this <laughs> idea. And also because, you know, back in those days, it was common for two men or boys to sleep in the same bed, I mean, which he did with uh, with King, um, with uh, with his contemporary, Francis. Francis, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, was King it Philip. I'm Philip, sorry, King Philip. Philip II. Right, right. Yeah, Philip II. So, they, you know, they, and that's what they play up in the movie, that they have this torrid love affair. And, mm -hmm. You know, no, nothing like that. And when you look at, and I actually quote real scholars who address this issue, but when you look at the primary sources of who Richard was, I mean, you want to talk about <laughs> toxic masculinity or like just overflowing with testosterone. He, of all the characters in, in my book of the eight, I think he's the just the most brutal and just like a juggernaut. And this comes, I mean, it comes from the sources, but it comes from the Muslim sources, which is really interesting. I mean, they themselves highlight that he was basically a mountain of a man that would be the first into the fray before his own men, and he's the king, and he would just butcher, you know, dozens of Muslims at one, you know, one one conflict. So he was, you know, a very fierce warrior, 
and also another popular idea of Richard is he's, you know, he's not really religious. He's not really into Christianity. It's kind of like he just wants to fight and have a good time. Um, well, no, that's not what the sources say. Again, you know, the one one I, I discussed a bit of it, but one notable point is um, in the very end, he was he was told as part of the treaty with Saladin that he could visit the Holy Land, you know, and, and no problems. But he said, I will not. I will not take from the. Inf- I will not take as a gift from the infidels what God will not give me. Um, you know, I have to. I have to liberate it, or I'm not even going to enter it. Hmm. Uh, so, Richard, very interesting character. Again, not like some some of the people in the book. Okay, like El Cid and Richard. We sort of, you know, the popular culture knows them. They're just not like that in the book at all. Uh, again, based on primary sources, and you see why because they don't want you to know. The truth, which is that these men were moved by the religion, that these men were noble, that they were self. And these were kings. Ferdinand, for example, and um, Richard were kings who had a lot to live for, and they could have just sent their men. But they were always in the forefront fighting, and it just—it's it, just a reflection of you know the, the, their self-sacrifice for what for their faith and what they believed. Hmm. You've got, uh, and we're only going to scratch the surface of the book here, but that's that's good because I really encourage people to get a copy of Defenders of the West and read it because you're right. Each one of these chapters could be a standalone movie. And uh, clearly some of these gentlemen have been the focus of, uh, been featured in, in films. Probably not done justice uh, based on what I've been reading so far in the primary sources. But I, I did notice the last three chapters all deal with the Balkans. Uh, John Hunyadi, I'm not familiar with. Skanderbeg, I'm not familiar with. But uh, we'll get to the last guy here in just a minute. But why so much attention on the Balkans? What was it historically that made that such a a point of contention between Christendom and Islam? Well, uh, so from the very start in the 7th century, Islam was, of course, a conquering creed through the jihad. And it absorbed and swallowed up all this Christian territory from all of North Africa, from Egypt to Morocco, and of course, Southwest Asia, Asia, what we call the Middle East, Syria, greater Syria, which encompassed Israel and Lebanon and, uh, uh, you know, even portions of Iraq. So after that, um, all that was left, um, see, unlike the Crusaders, the Crusaders were ideologically driven. So they just went straight to one point, Jerusalem, the Holy Land, which meant they were always surrounded by enemies. Okay, but the Jihad was smarter. It was basically... Um, whatever we're closest to, we're going to attack, absorb, consolidate, then attack the next infidel that abuts against our region. So once all of North Africa and um, you know the Middle East was taken, all that was left was Asia. The next on the picking list was Asia Minor. Of course, in the West, Spain had been conquered. And you had what we were discussing, the Reconquista. But so now the Turks are the standard bearers of the Jihad, and they conquer Asia Minor. And then what's what's next after Asia Minor? Well, you're in Europe now, properly which is the Balkans. Um, so that became the next, uh, you know, contested field. And the Ottomans, you know, they went in and for centuries conquered and annexed uh, a lot of these, you know, European countries. And, and it's interesting because you, you understand now why the Southeastern or Eastern European countries are not are, are none too fond of Islam as opposed to Western Europe. They actually have a very recent history under Islam. You know, mm-hmm. Some of these countries like Romania were under Islamic occupation for about four centuries. Um, but in the book, uh, I talk about the earlier portions of this when Islam was entering and advancing into the Balkans. And that's where um, these various heroes that you mentioned, such as John Hunyadi and Skanderbeg, emerge. And uh, it's interesting because Skanderbeg is Hunyadi very much, but Skanderbeg is probably historically <laughs> the most celebrated Christian hero. If you if you spoke about a Christian hero vis-a-vis Islam, it was actually Skanderbeg. There's thousands of books were written about him in Europe, and he was, you know, widely praised. And if you, when you read the chapter, you'll see why, because he essentially, you know, he he, he was abducted as a child. Uh, of course, he was Christian. He's Albanian. Mm-hmm. His name, his real name is George Castriotti. And he was abducted and turned into a janissary, which, as you know, is a, a Islamic uh, slave soldier mm-hmm. who's indoctrinated, forced into Islam, you know, circumcised, trained to be a jihadist, and then let loose on his own his former kin. Um, so he, he was trained into that, rose in the highest echelons of the military, became a general, had like large contingents of Ottomans under his control. And when the time was right, he actually broke free of the Ottomans and went and re- returned back to the uh, Albania and became their leader. And it's interesting, you see in the books, his dialogues of how, you know, he explains how he was always Christian at heart, but the only way to survive, his brothers were also taken captive and they were all killed hmm. under the Ottomans. 
Um, he, pro- he, he was possibly sexually molested because, and I discussed that a bit in the book, uh, that was a very popular thing amongst the sultans. Uh, but he broke away free. You know, he left all the wealth and power that he had there as an adult and as a general. And he just, he, he ended up, he's called the Albanian Braveheart. Hmm. So you know, the William Wallace story, it's very similar. Um, you know, he just lived in caves with his people, fought with the Ottomans, o- always outnumbered one to 10, one to 20, and always prevailed hmm. uh, due to his military genius and just his leadership. Uh, very interesting character. It's one that uh, we're not familiar with uh, here in the West. Again, I'd never heard of Skanderbeg, and I'm looking forward to reading through this over the next few days um, as I've been trying to catch up on uh, uh, other other projects. I've not had the opportunity to dive deeply past the first couple of chapters here, but uh, your, your writing, and, and you, this, this is true of Sword and Scimitar as well, is uh, very captivating, and your use of the primary sources really illuminates a period of history that most of us are ignorant about. I was really curious, really interested to see that the final chapter in your book is devoted to Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> Not a guy that most of us would consider a Christian because of the way he's been fictionalized, courtesy of Bram Stoker, who interestingly is a character that uh, Sharon has brought into her fiction series, uh, The Red Wing Saga. But uh, as you know, most of us know him as uh, Count Dracula. So how is it that he winds up in Defenders of the West? Well, you know, as you say, you know, he's a he's a great example of how, you know, you have a historical character and then slowly and slowly he's turned and transformed something that he, he doesn't really represent. So as you say, you know, how, he's in a book called The Christian Heroes Who Stood Against Islam. I thought he was a monster. Well, OK, there's some room for that. And I, I get into all the facts. But long story short, he's another Romanian prince who, with his brother, is, is submitted as a hostage to the Ottoman Turks and held in, in essentially a fortress in prison. He watches his brother become a catamite of Muhammad II or Mahmoud II, the sultan, um, essentially. just And there's it's very graphic. Um, how he molests him. And I assume the same thing happened to Dracula or Vlad. You know, we, we, anyway, when he, like like uh, Skanderbeg, when he could, he broke away from them, even though he was essentially being groomed. Uh, what the Ottomans would always do is they would take Christian princes and groom them after humiliating them and, you know, making them pure dependence on them and then set them as puppets and, and, and return them back to their kingdoms, in this case, Wallachia. Uh, but he broke away free from that and became his own uh, king, or as or as called Voivod or warlord of Wallachia. And um, and <laughs> and what's really interesting about him is just he the way he just slapped the Ottomans in their face left and right every time they try to win him over, placate him, manipulate him. He just would not you know in any way give in. And um, there's so many different anecdotes. Uh, of what he did. And so for the, one of the more famous anecdotes which I bring in is uh, Muhammad sends his emissaries to basically threaten Vlad and tell him, you better start paying jizya, tribute, and you better submit your children to become janissaries because they were collecting janissaries from the Romanians or the Wallachians at the time. And uh, the first thing Vlad says to these emissaries, is, how come you don't remove your turbans in my presence? Don't you know I'm, a, I'm royalty? And they say, well, it's our religious custom. So he actually had na- had the turbans nailed into their heads and said, well, since it's your custom, I'm going to help you maintain it. So that's the kind of guy he, he was. I mean, that's just, so definitely dark sense of humor. As far as what made him really popular, which is which is part of his moniker, Vlad the Impaler or Tsepish, um, he learned that from the Ottomans. And that's what you're not told. So we're right, told, right. oh, Vlad the Impaler, he impaled people. They don't tell you that he learned that from the Ottomans during his time as a hostage, and he was essentially fighting fire with fire, because that's what the Ottomans were doing to all of their enemies. Moreover, it was a common thing back then. It was even other Christian powers, uh, you know, uh, were would use impalement. It was a recognized form of, uh, you know, execution. So be that as it may, it um, it doesn't really make him the monster that you would think, because in his historical context, that was kind of normal. Uh, believe it or not. But anyway, long story short, he had a lot of enemies, including amongst, uh, you know, Christians. And, uh, you know, his life is during the time of the Gutenberg press. And his life is in many ways the first example of fake stories or fake news, because what his enemies did um, is they took the, the accounts of what he did, which is impale people and which was cruel, but they really colored it and went out of their way to exaggerate. And that's where you get 
if you look at the sources, it's it's called and it's the Saxons from Transylvania who created this in the Hungarian king's court. But if you look at the sources, I mean, the, the things that they attributed to him, uh, you know, just really vile, bizarre, insane, sadistic things, uh, which your average objective historian doesn't buy into a historian doesn't buy into them. They're just it was propaganda. Yeah, he impaled and he did and he engaged in both by our standards is cruelty like everyone else. Um, at any rate, but he was again a, a very ferocious fighter. And uh, in the book, I actually came across accidentally the primary source that gave rise to this idea that you know he was like a black cloud flying like a like a bats, which you see in Hollywood movies. Yeah, it's actually in one of the battles that he went in trying to assassinate the Sultan because they invaded Romania, something like 150,000 men against 10,000 well, Wallachians. So you know he decided to cut the head of the snake, and one night. With his men and with torches, he barged into the Ottoman camp looking to find the sultan's head. Uh, and he almost got it, but he didn't. Uh, so really, again, very colorful character. But again, so if you look at his life, you know, he's pious according to the standards of the time. He spent a lot of time in monasteries. He spent a lot of money to, to upkeep monasteries, including Mount Athos. Um, you know, hmm. in, in churches. So, in, you know, and whenever he would execute someone, he would make sure he'd give them Christian rites. So, you know, very, very interesting contradiction. But again, not not that contradictory when you put it in context. Interesting that he was a sponsor of Mount Athos. I understand that uh, uh, his namesake, Vlad Putin, visited Mount Athos in 2015. It took him a few tries to get there, whether and other things got in the way. But uh, that's not something, again, that uh, most Christians here in the West are familiar with and and how Putin has sort of changed the the uh, religious temperature of Russia since day. Not, not arguing that he's a good guy, just... Just it, again, this is an aspect of news and history that most of us in the West are not used to looking at. Uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, John Hunyadi and and Vlad, or at least Vlad's father, were were contemporaries. What, what, was there a relationship between the two of them? If so, uh, how do they how do they get on? Sure. So Hunyadi has his own chapter again. Another right. very impressive warrior. Uh, he became the governor and regent of Hungary. Uh, you know, he was one of the first who took t- who took the offensive to the Turks, which was unheard of back then. You're just happy to know that they're leaving you alone or you're defending yourself. But he would, in the middle of winter, when no one was expecting it, mobilize his men and go and invade Ottoman territory and completely. Uh, in fact, I was talking about Skanderbeg. Skanderbeg broke away from the Ottomans during a time when Hunyadi was attacking the Ottomans. And therefore, he provided him with the opportunity, not that they knew each other at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh so, very, you know, again, very impressive man, um, you know, the siege of Belgrade. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't want to ruin this for people, but a lot of these men, you know, they all die in their 40s and 50s, some 30s, uh, despite being nobles and kings and lords, because of just the way they threw themselves, you know, with the great violence to d- defy the Islamic Jihad. Yeah, yeah. Um, and definitely Hunyadi is one of them. As far as, uh, so, as I was saying, you know, earlier the Ottomans had this trick where they would take and groom Christian princes, and they did that with Vlad's father, mm-hmm. uh, Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, who was also named Vlad, Vlad the Second. Our Vlad, Dracula, is the third. Um, and Hunyadi, of course, they're from the same area, Transylvania, John Hunyadi and the, both Vlad's father and son. Um, at one point, you know, Hunyadi could not take it anymore with the vacillation of Vlad, the father of Dracula. And eventually an uprising occurred, which John Hunyadi was supposed to be behind, and and he was ousted, uh, Dracula's father. But apparently Hunyadi helped his son, our Dracula, the Impaler, come into his own, come into power. So there was, it's, there's, and that's one of the things that I encountered in writing this. It's never clear cut. You know, you have a lot of, you know, just a, a lot of nuances going on, mm-hmm. you know, inner politics between these various Christian kingdoms and so forth. And, Which is not unlike today. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and you go into that quite a bit in uh, Sword and Scimitar, where it's clear in some of the uh, the battles that took place, the key battles in these uh, this 14th century ongoing conflict that uh, had the uh, forces of Christendom been a little more... United. United. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but but you see that pattern over and over again. I mean, if the uh, if the Celtic tribes had been a little more united when the Angles and Saxons came in, it might still be Britain instead of Angleland, and uh, the same here in the United States uh, when the the white man came across the Appalachians. If uh, Tecumseh had been able to hold the tribes together, things might be very different here today. It, it's fascinating history, and it's not the mainstream history of uh, that that we normally get 
from, uh, well, apologists. Uh, again, I read Karen Armstrong just to get a sense for what a mainstream historian was saying. And it's, it's almost comical the way she defends Muhammad's change of tactics with things after 10 years of uh, evangelizing weren't going well. And suddenly, he, ah, OK, if we start, you know, camel raids, we keep all the stuff and, and get all the women. And uh, that's what Allah wants you to do. Th- hey, that worked. And she defends it as saying, well, you know, they were a bunch of merchants. They, they didn't have any other way to make a living. So they had to raid. the Really? Now, anyway, Muhammad is a prophet for our time. That's the title of her book. <laughs> That's a profit for our time. <laughs> well, uh, sadly, she's probably right about that, uh, but maybe not in the way she thinks. Uh, the book is Defenders of the West. Raymond Ibrahim is the author. It is uh, just, a, a, again, fascinating work. And uh, I, I've read Sword and Scimitar twice and will uh, no doubt read this again. And looking forward to getting deeper into the chapters on the Balkans, um, because that starts getting into the area where, well, as you wrote about in Sword and Scimitar, uh, the uh, Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, dividing Christendom at the worst possible moment, um, a, a dynamic that most of us don't think about when we start uh, looking at history. And that's close enough that some of us can trace our ancestry back that far and yeah. think, ah, OK, how did that affect my ancestors who left uh, Switzerland Right about the time the uh, Ottomans and, and headed to the area around Stuttgart, Germany, right around the time that the Vienna was under siege. So, uh, you know, how, how did that dynamic play out? I don't know. I need to do more research. Anyway, thank you for taking time out. Thank you for your research and your work. Again, you're uh, in many ways a lone voice. I, I know there are others who kind of uh, tread the same path that you're on, but it's not one that's uh, going to win you uh, a lot of friends in the corporate media. So I appreciate uh, what you do and appreciate you uh, being willing to come on this little program. No, oh, thanks very much, Derek. I really appreciate it. It's it's, it's my uh, it's my passion, and as you say, a lot of people is, there's just so much fake history, which to me is you know fake news, but in a more important way because if you don't know where we come from, you don't know where we are or where we're going. Um, but anyway, I, I, I appreciate it, and thanks for having me on. You find links in the notes at VFTB.net or if you're watching this at YouTube, which is uh, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gilbert House, you'll find in the notes below a link to Raymond's website and a link to uh, Raymond's uh, new book, Defenders of the West. Highly recommended and uh, very interesting reading because he draws so heavily on the uh, source material, contemporaries of the men he's writing about. And that's that's a perspective, again, that we don't get in our modern or postmodern world where there's no such thing as truth. Your truth may not be my truth. Who's to say what's true? That's a worldview that can get you killed if you're walking across the street. Maybe there's a bus coming. Maybe it's not. Eh, Maybe it's true for the driver, but not for me. Truth exists, and denying it can hurt you. RaymondIbrahim.com is website. Go check out his uh, regular column on uh, ongoing Christian persecution of Christians around the world, because uh, you won't hear it in the corporate media, but it is a thing. Christians, whether you hear about it on the news or not. The truth is Christians are the most persecuted religious group on planet Earth. Well, we've got a couple of conferences coming up. In fact, one is just one week away, as you're seeing this now. I'll be in California for the Dark Secrets and Bright Hopes Conference that begins on the 16th, September 16th through the 18th. Be there with L.A. Marzulli. Glad to see uh, L.A. again, L.A. and Peggy. Uh, Dr. Brian Artis will be there as well. He's been very outspoken about the uh, the pandemic and various things associated with this. Pastor Dave Bryan putting this together at his church, Church of Glad Tidings in Live Oak, California. That is uh, just north of um, Yuba City, which is in turn just north of Sacramento. So if you're in that area in California, please consider coming out to join us. I think there's still time to sign up. You can find out more at the website, churchofgladtidings.com, churchofgladtidings.com. And um, speaking of spiritual warfare, which is really what this whole conflict between Islam and uh, Christendom is about, uh, next month, Sharon and I will be in her old stomping grounds near Louisville, Kentucky, which is just downriver from uh, her hometown of Madison, Indiana which if you've read any of her early fictional work, like Winds of Evil and uh, Signs and Wonders, The Armageddon Strain, it's really set in and around Madison. Um, If you read Eden, Indiana, 
Uh, just substitute Hanover and you get an idea where she's uh, writing about. Anyway, we'll be in Jeffersonville, Indiana, for an advanced spiritual warfare training workshop the weekend of October 14th, 15th, and 16th with L.A. Marzulli again, David Hevner, and it's in fact, it's his building, his facility where we're going to be holding this. Uh, he purchased an old church and is using it for his video production, uh, including production of his uh, television series, The Last Evangelist. David Hevner, Tom Dunn, through the Black Ministries, Vicki Joy Anderson, author of They Only Come Out at Night, Sanda Allison, Tracy Tennant, and more. Uh, this is pr- being produced by Hear the Watchman Ministries, our good friends Mike Kerr and Jeannie Moore. And uh, we invite you to join us for this. I know Sharon's going to have some family members there, and we're really looking forward to seeing them. But uh, we'd love to see you, too. If you're in and around southern Indiana, northern Kentucky, Louisville, southeast Illinois, it's a short hop over, relatively speaking. Uh, we hope you can join. If you're in the Cincinnati area, it's, uh, what, maybe an hour and a half down, the, if I remember correctly, because I remember Madison's about halfway between Cincinnati and uh, Louisville, and uh, it's about 45 minutes either way, if I remember right. Anyway, um, hope you can join us. You can find out more at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com. Please take advantage of our free mobile app, get you all of our video content, this program, the two weekly shows that we produce for our network affiliates, uh, Sci Friday and Unraveling Revelation, plus our weekly audio Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship, which is released every Sunday around noontime-ish, depending on uh, when we get up and get going on Sundays. Uh, but uh, you'll find all of it at our, at our mobile app, which is absolutely free. Uh, gets you uh, all of that content, iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire, phones and tablets. It also works on Roku. There's a Roku edition and an Apple TV version as well. So you can uh, put it right on the big screen. But if you've got it on your mobile app and you've got a relatively recent smart TV, you can generally cast those things to the TV using Google's Chromecast or Apple's AirPlay, depending on the type of mobile device you've got. So um, find out more at our website, gilberthouse.org slash app and uh, get the app there and uh, bypass the gatekeepers of big tech because uh, even though we didn't get uh, totally banned from YouTube the way Skywatch TV did, um, we have had programs, especially Sci Friday. Uh, there was one episode of A View from the Bunker that got yanked by YouTube, a uh, particular guest who was very outspoken about uh, the uh, pandemic uh, that uh, got that episode pulled. Uh, but Sci Friday, we had a couple of those pulled from YouTube as well for things that we didn't even say. So bypass that just to, because our mobile app comes from a Christian company called Subsplash and uh, they've been wonderful to work with. Excellent customer service and um, reliability is awesome and they don't, they don't try to uh, censor us. So uh, get the app and that way you'll always be in contact and we truly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen, whether it's the app with our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gilbert House, or if you're listening to the audio podcast, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever else you might find us, which is, of course, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Uh, our announcer, always tip of the hat to uh, the inimitable DC Good and a View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We do this every week because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. Mm-hmm.